Welcome to Using Python's Date Time. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. This course gives an introduction to the messy world of managing dates and times in software. As the title implies, it primarily focuses on Python's date time module, but also shows some other things along the way. In this course, you will learn about how messy dates, times, and time zones are, the date time module, time zones in Python, and how to do date and time math. Code in this course was tested using Python 3.10. Time zone handling changed significantly in Python 3.9 when things previously managed by third-party libraries were brought into the standard library. The changes were significant enough that they were backported to older versions. If you're using something prior to Python 3.9, I'll point you at the backports when I get there. Python has three main modules included as part of the standard library for dealing with dates and times. The main one you probably want to use is date time, which also includes tools for date objects, time objects, and time deltas, although this one's a bit rudimentary. Dates and times are messy things. There are loads of formats out there. As a Canadian, I can tell you that I get bit by this all the time. Our American neighbors use a different short form when they write dates. The difference between day, month, year versus month, day, year can be unclear up until the 13th of the month. As a programmer, I try to insist on year, month, day, the international standard, but standard or not, it isn't always used. Time zones can also cause craziness. There are more time zones in the world than the 24 hours in the clock. That right there tells you something. Not to keep bringing up the Canadian thing, but it is another good example of the mess. Canada has six time zones, one of which, Newfoundland Standard Time, has a half-hour difference from its nearest neighbor. Combine that with the problem of daylight savings time, which is also messy. One of our provinces, Saskatchewan, doesn't follow daylight savings. So in the winter, it aligns with Central Standard Time and has the same time as its neighbor to the east, Manitoba, while in the summer, it aligns with its neighbor on the other side, Alberta, as it syncs with Mountain Standard Time. Take off, eh? There's new doot about it. Deet and times are messy. Now that I've slagged my fellow Canadians, next up, I'll dive further into all the complications of dates and times. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course and did a bad imitation of a Canadian accent. Insert your own joke about not being able to hear the difference here. In this lesson, I'll talk about all the complexities of dates and times while sticking to my regular speaking voice. In the overview, I gave a quick peek at how messy dates and times can be. Some things to consider when coding with dates and times are time zones, which, by the way, can change. I don't mean it changes for you because you're traveling. I mean where they are and what the difference is from GMT. Time zones don't just naturally divide the world into 24 segments. For practical reasons, it doesn't make sense for a boundary to split a city in two just because it is on a particular meridian. Time zones, thus, tend to follow political boundaries, countries and states and provinces within countries. Look at a time zone map and you'll find few of the boundaries are actually straight lines. Another challenge is daylight savings time. In and of itself, this is messy. The time difference for a particular location can change based on the day, and if that's not enough, mm, these things can change. You know what the candy industry, golf courses, and barbecue companies all have in common? They have lobbyists who in 2005 got a bill signed in the United States to change when daylight savings would take effect. Before 2007, Canada and the U.S. changed to daylight savings just before Halloween. As of 2007, it now happens afterwards. If you're writing software that needs to take into account dates and times in the past, complications can arise just a little over a decade ago. It's not like you have to be dealing with ancient times to have a problem. Cue the jokes about those of us born before the millennium being from ancient times. If those two things aren't enough, how about the fact that every four years the length of a year is different? Or the fact that the speed of the rotation of the Earth is changing and to keep noon on a clock in sync when the sun is at its apex, we introduced leap seconds. What makes all this worse is a whole bunch of things about dates and times isn't just regional, but also cultural. I mentioned the American short form for dates versus the typical European one. 
versus the international standard, and the only sane one, most significant digits first for the win. And all of these things have something in common. They're part of Western culture. The Hebrew, Islamic, and many Asian date systems are lunar-based. And although both the Hebrew and Islamic calendars are both lunar, the Hebrew calendar has leap months, whereas the Islamic one does not. Even the concept of a year is arbitrary. Older history books use the Christian base BCAD to indicate when year one occurred. Newer books use BCECE to indicate Common Era and Before Common Era to remove the religious overtone. That's just a renaming, though. Hebrew year one is 3761 BCE, whereas Islamic year one is 622 CE. And of course, neither of them flip over on the Gregorian calendar's January 1st. Okay, so I've established that it's messy. Let's talk about what computers do about it. Most computer operating systems track the amount of time since January 1st, 1970. This is known as the Unix Epoch. It, as you might guess from the name, has to do with Unix operating systems being written around this time. The Epoch itself wasn't consistent when it first came out, but eventually got standardized. The POSIX-1 standard decided to ignore the complexity of leap seconds, which at the time seemed the simpler thing to do for library writers. When this standard came out, most Unix computers used 32 bits to store time, which gave them about 136 years, half before and half after the epoch. At the time, computers were used mostly for localized record keeping, and this seemed like more than enough. As 2038 barrels down on us, 32 bits is starting to seem problematic. A lot of older coders I knew made out like bandits during the Y2K fiasco. 2038 seems like a good retirement plan, assuming my whiskey habit allows me to live that long. Well, that got dark fast. So you've got some dates and times that you want to store. Now what? First off, don't assume you know where your user is. The problem became particularly obvious when the World Wide Web came about. The location of the computer and the location of the user now typically have nothing to do with each other. The most common tactic is to use UTC time, which is the zero offset time zone. Due to historical things, including maps, wars, and colonization, time zones were relative to the Greenwich Meridian a line that passed through Greenwich, England. When this became a proper international standard, there was a need to distinguish the time zone from the zero offset, as Greenwich might want to do something crazy like have daylight savings time. What does UTC stand for, you might ask? Coordinated Universal Time. Funny story. English speakers wanted to call it CUT, Coordinated Universal Time. French speakers wanted to call it TUC, Temps Universel Coordonné. And the compromise was to jumble the letters to UTC. What's the old joke about horses, camels, and committees? Storing time as UTC works in certain simple cases, like debug log entries, for example, but can get complicated with changes to time zone rules. Consider the Halloween change I mentioned before. That change happened due to a bill passed in 2005. Let's say it's 2004 and you want to make an entry in your calendar for a big Halloween bash at 7 p.m. five years later. That date gets stored as UTC. Unless you also store the date and time of when the appointment was created, you have no way of knowing how to adjust the appointment. Of course, the party will likely still take place at 7 p.m., but because of the rule change to daylight savings time, your UTC stored data will now be off by an hour. Confused? Let me try it one more time. The appointment was created before a rule change, but for a time that happens after the rule change. And as you have no way of knowing about a change that might happen in the future, you can end up with a problem. If that's not messy enough, it gets problematic when you start trying to deal with dates that happened before the Unix epoch. Before 1918, Russia used the Julian calendar. As of February 14, 1918, they changed to a Gregorian calendar to be in sync with the rest of Europe. They lost 13 days in the process, the difference between the two calendars. If you're storing January 5, 1917 in UTC without more context, you could be off by almost two weeks. Of course, all of this messiness depends on your application. For a calendar application, you could assume only dates moving forward are important, which would simplify a lot of things. 
For a genealogy application, you might want all sorts of extra info to go along with any date in your system. I think I've spent enough time scaring you. Next up, how to code some of this nuttiness in Python. In the previous lesson, I explained how complicated dates and times could be. In this lesson, I'll introduce you to the main Python module for dates and times, date time. There are three standard libraries in Python for dealing with dates and times, calendar, time, and date time. Let's go play with some of these in the REPL. I'll start out with the time library. Let me import it, and then call the time function inside of it. This returns the number of seconds since the Unix epoch. Remember how I mentioned the 32-bit storage problem? Well, the maximum integer in 32 signed storage is 2.1 billion. That number right there, that's starting to get pretty close. Just over 500 million seconds to go. Python has date, time, and date time modules. As the date time module handles both dates and times, it is preferred to use that for both cases. Let me import it. You can create a date by specifying the year, month, and day as arguments. Or a time by specifying the hour, minutes, and seconds. Or a date time by specifying all those things. The date class has a class method that returns today's date. That was February 20th, 2022, when I recorded this. The date time class has something similar called now. Normally, it is my jokes that date me. The code on the screen is a rather specific point in time. You can access the different parts of a date time object using attributes with the same names as the arguments to the initializer. Here, I've created a time object using the hour, minute, and second attributes of the date time object previously created and stored in the now variable. The date time class also has a constructor called combine, which creates a new date time object by combining a date object with a time object. You can also create date time objects by parsing strings. This is particularly useful if the information you have isn't in standard ISO 8610. That's the official name of the year, month, day, etc. format. Here's the date and time in the American format. And now a format specifier. And passing them both to date times string parse time method. And you get a resulting date time object or an exception if you mucked something up like forgetting a percent sign, like I did the first three times I recorded this. Let's dig in just a little bit more to that mini language of percent signs that specify a format string. The parsing format I just showed you is part of a mini language that specifies all sorts of different ways of expressing date and time things. This table shows some of the more common ones. The mini language is based on the corresponding 1989 C language standard that does the same thing. That's also why the function is named strp time instead of something pronounceable. There's a corresponding string format time, strf time, for taking a date time object and generating a formatted string using the same specifiers. This mini language is pretty common across a lot of different languages. You'll find it in PHP and Perl, for example. Speaking of parsing dates and times, a popular third-party library for parsing dates is called Date Parser. It includes the ability to parse human-readable date-time concepts like yesterday or Morgen, which is tomorrow in German. 
Throughout this course, I'm going to show the steps to building a little utility that uses some of the date-time concepts I'm talking about. You may remember there was a big fuss that the world might end in December of 2012 due to the rollover of the Mayan calendar. The Mayan long count calendar has a 5,125 year cycle in it made up of 13 segments called Baktun. On December 12, 2012, the 13th Baktun came to an end. When the millennium changed over, everyone was going to party like it was 1999, see Prince, comma, artists formerly known as. But can you imagine what it'd be like to party like it was the 13th Baktun? Anyhow, the code in the top window tells you how long you have survived since the so-called end of the world. Is it the end of your car when the odometer flips over? People are strange. Line 4 creates a date-time object specifying the last second of the 13th Baktun. Line 5 calculates the difference between right now and the Baktun. Finally, line 7 prints out the result. Let's run this in the console. And there you have it, 3,347 days and some bit. Party on, dude. You've seen the simple form of Python's date-time object. Next up, I'll augment that with some time zone information.